Well, we're standing here at Weatherglass Corner in Peel. Now, some people call it Spit Corner, and there are quite a few of the Peel people who don't like to hear it called Spit Corner. I think Betty Kelly was one of them, and Philip Simpson was another. It was different from this. There was more of a corner to it. And the fishermen used to congregate here, and the theory was that they were and that's why they call it Spit Corner. But I wonder, because behind you there, there's a bit of a key going out. And I wonder if that was the spit going out. But no matter, this here is the, the weather glass anyway, in Glass Emshire, which for a while was up in the market in Peel. Now, my wife's mother, and people only a year or two older than me, would call that the foreshore. But everybody now, including you, calls it the beach. Well, when I was a lad, Anybody who called it the beach had obviously just come off a shower on a day trip. We never called it the beach. We used to get quite annoyed about it. And another one is way up there past the hill is Corrin's Tower. Some people call it Corrin's Folly. In fact, it's down on the 1869 map as a, as a folly as well as Corrin's Tower. But <sighs> Corrin wasn't a fool. I think Corrin actually had that built as a sort of a winter work scheme to provide employment for the men who were out of work. So that's uh, as much as I can talk about here for the minute. Well, when this building here was first built, the Peel Cruising and Sailing Club, everybody called it the Taj Mahal because they thought it was quite fanciful with the tower on it. But over there, it's called Munn's Gable, and at one time that gable of that house used to be right on the edge of the shore. And in the north wind it would be taking some tremendous heavy seas. And there's a saying in Peel, or there certainly used to be a saying in Peel, as thick as Munn's Gable, because they reckon it must have been at least a metre thick. But going back to my wife's late mother, she reckoned that on the shore here, depending on which street in Peel you lived on, you had your own section of the shore and if you trespassed into the turf of another little gang you, you were likely to end up in trouble. It didn't seem to bother the visitors because you know they had the whole shore all to themselves. But uh, a school friend of mine, Sue Kegg as she was at the time, she's now Sue Dixon, she was brought up in the blue house there. And she's seen the deeds and she said that was Munn's house. Now Munn was the captain of the garrison in Peel Castle and he had that house built in 1797 or 8 I believe but he never got to live in it because the poor fellow, I think he died of pneumonia when the house was finished. This used to be the police station here in Peel. There have been several police stations in Peel but this one as far as I remember, it had a, a lovely carved English royal coat of arms on it with a lion and a unicorn. And, but that disappeared. It was taken down and I believe it ended up on the governor's house, so I was told. We're standing here in Castle Street and behind us down there is Crown Street. But just around the corner, there's a place called Seaforth House. And that used to be the Marine. That was the original Marine Hotel before the new Marine was built on Shore Road. Now, at one time, there was a man called Spurrier. He, I suppose he'd be Victorian. He'd be what they would have called a masha or possibly a heavy swell, you know, he was a real large order. He used to come in from Douglas on a, a little sort of a, a carriage drawn by two horses and he used to drink there in the Marine. Now, there was a time he was in there and a man said to him, I bet you that you cannot drink this full pint of raw eggs in one go. And he drank it and he died. And it turned out that the man who had challenged him was a man called Palmer, Dr. Palmer, who years later ended up being hanged in England because he poisoned a lot of other people. So we reckon that he was probably the first victim of Palmer the Poisoner. And there's a man who was living there in Seaforth House and he was bothered by uh, the apparition of a man up on uh, the landing on the stairs. 
a, a really gloomy looking man in a top hat which naturally enough you don't uh, you don't want to be meeting every night but later on this man was shown a picture of Palmer and he said that's him that's the ghost that's haunting this place but they reckon Spuria also haunts or, or used to haunt the street every night people said that they could hear Spurrier's two horses and carriage rattling up Castle Street here on his way back to Douglas now Betty Kelly asked John Cairn how are you settling in John he said well it's, it's all right there he said but Every night I'm being woken up by horses running up the street. <laughs> There's also another story that Fred Palmer had written in one of his books. He said, if you see a horse-drawn hearse in Crown Street, you know there's going to be a death in your family. We're now standing in Castle Street, which used to be called Big Street. And at one time, every house in Castle Street was a public house. They might not have had a, a bar with uh, taps and such like an optics, but they probably would have a barrel of beer put in every week, which they'd be selling in, in the front rooms. But behind me here, Ty Inzi, the house of learning or the house of teaching, is a house where Edmund Goodwin used to live. Edmund Goodwin, the famous man who wrote the first lessons in Manx, he did a lot for the Manx language. A bit further down, I think at one time that was called the Bishop's House, and all along here, underneath these three old houses in particular, amongst the oldest houses in Peel, they were connected with the garrison for the castle, there's a great big cellar. If you, if you actually go down into the old bonded warehouse there, you can see the cellar underneath, and the cellar ran from here to there, a sort of a vaulted, I'm getting excited here now, waving my arms around, a sort of a vaulted uh, cellar. And that was connected with the running trade, apparently, the trade as they called it. They used to store the stuff there because it was not actually illegal to bring bottles of brandy and, and whatever you want to call it into the Isle of Man. It was only illegal when it was taken from here over to England in order to avoid the much higher customs duties in England. Uh, behind us here is the Central, which is known as the Deaf House, because at one time the man and the woman who had it were both deaf. And there was a story at my father, and I think it was connected with this same place, that there was a man living here who used to go around playing the accordion, I think, or possibly a hurdy-gurdy, and he'd go outside somebody's house and he'd be playing away, and if there was nobody in, he'd leave a bill for the music. But I don't think anybody ever paid him. I remember being at a session there in the deaf house. It used to be good. Colin Jerry was there, Phil Gorry, a few other people. Yeah, they called themselves Boy Doll at the very beginning, Blind Boy. Colin was very keen on playing Manx music. And I remember being in there 40 odd years ago, I think. A sort of a visiting English folk music enthusiast was there and he started singing some sort of an English song. You know how the English folk singers were like, yeah, yeah, yeah. And I got into an argument with somebody over it. And I ended up pouring a pint of beer over his head. Nothing came of it, because he was, well, he's not as big as me. <laughs> the just here is the Peel branch of Dumbles Bank, which went bust in 1900, and a lot of people lost a lot of money over that. But latterly, it was the town hall up until sometime in the 50s, when the new town hall was built up there. Just there on the sort of the little corner is number 15 uh, Castle Street which was where apparently Moore's Kipper Yard was first set up because on the gable, on the chimney stack, at one time you could actually see the thing that said Moore's. I remember talking to Jennifer Curtis, because Curtis then took over the Kipper Yard and she said, oh no, no, it's, it said Curtis, that was never Moore's, but I said, yes, it's got Moore's painted up on the, on the chimney stack. And so it had.
just behind me here is the old crown. Don't take any notice of uh, 1643 because that's another bit of Barknut. I was told that there was a man who had been a clown in Liverpool and he had this place and he was the one who put the date on it. But my grandfather and my grandmother had this place in the 20s as a pie shop and just recently I've seen the deeds when it was sold and they sold it for I think something like £400 and then they bought 34 Patrick Street for I think it was about 260 in about 1930. Now Jack Sloan said that concerning this place here which is now a sort of a curio shop it used to be a grocer's and I believe it was a branch of a sort of a, a nationwide grocers but they reckon that the man in here in Dibs the grocers he had a habit when he was measuring out the dry goods onto his scales he tipped the scale like that tip tip to see if it would go down and stay down so that he wasn't giving you even a fraction of an ounce over and he had the nickname tip the scales I, I, I collect nicknames and that was one of the ones that Jack Sloan gave me Behind me here, Station Road, which used to be known as the Well Brew, or it, it, actually on the 1869 map it's the Well Brow, but no matter. And you see the steps there, if you go up the steps you get to where the well was, and that was possibly the source of water for people all around. My father had a story that there was a man called, he called him Johnny Tencoats, and he used to be pushed around in a bath chair and he would pay the children, whatever it was, a halfpenny or so, to push him around for the afternoon. But it just shows how different versions of the story can come about because Betty Kelly said that that man was called Billy Seven Waistcoats, not Johnny Ten Coats. And according to my father's story, he, he did tend to write himself into these traditional stories. He and some other boys were pushing uh, Johnny Tencoats at the top there of the well brew and they started fighting over who was going to hold the handles. So the, the upshot of it was there was nobody holding the handles and this bath chair ran away down the well brew and Johnny Tencoats went right in to the harbour and he was wearing so many coats that when they pulled him out he was as dry as a bone. Good story. But according to Betty's story, Billy Seven Waistcoats, it was girls who was holding the handle. But I don't know, I can't really believe the story because when you look at it, coming down Station Road there, it would be very difficult to actually get something to go into the harbour. So I don't know. My father used to be good friends with a, a grocer called Ben Kelly and he said that when the mongoose business was going on up there at Dawlish Cash and they went up there because it was like an entertainment and they went up to the, uh, the Dorby Spook House and they went in and, and according to my father he said the mongoose told them what they'd had to drink when they were in the waterfall on the way up and then it all came to an anti-climax when some of the local hooligans climbed up on the roof and put a turf on top of the chimney pot and smooked everybody out. There's supposed to be another haunting connected with Fenella Cottage here and I've heard at least two versions of it. One version was the man who bought the house, he was in bed one night and he felt something horribly cold and clammy alongside of him. And the story was that a woman who had lived there previously, she possibly committed suicide, I'm not sure, or fallen into the harbour or gone off into the sea. And this was supposed to be a, a physical manifestation of her coming back. But another version I heard, and I think this was actually from the man himself, it's the same man who was haunted by Palmer the Poisoner over in Seaforth House, was that it was actually it sounds crazy, there's a sort of a dream logic in it. It was actually a, a, a man in RAF uniform who'd lived here previously and died. 
and there was also a portrait of him. And that's how we identified who it was. But while I was telling this story to a group of people, uh, a few years ago, a lady living in the house came out and she told us a third version, which I've forgotten. Uh, where we're standing is at the bottom of what is now called Ari Lane and at the back there is what is now called Charles Street and I've just been reminded that it was named after Charles Morrison who was a, I think a relation of Sophia Morrison, might have been the father, I think he had a grocer's shop and just running down here is Queen Street. All of these places had different names on the 1869 map Ori Lane was called Watch House Street and I'm not entirely sure what a watch house is but over in Crown Street on the old map there's a thing that says Watch House. Then Charles Street was named Pilot Street for some reason and uh, just let this lady go past before I mention this. According to George Broderick, Queen Street was called Shit and Alley because there was only one toilet for all the houses in the street. I, in fact, if we go a little bit further and we went down Charles Street and took the dog leg, we would then end up in, it's now called Market Street, but at one time it was called College Street because of Moore's Mathematical School, which was further up on the corner, which was one of the two famous navigation schools that uh, there were in Peel. It was Gorn's School of Navigation up by Woods Slaughter Yard, which is now Looney's Car Park, and then of course Moore's, which was on Market Street. And Market Street ran from Moore's on up across the front of the Peel pa Castle Hotel. It actually ran up right up to Douglas Street, so the, the names have all been changed. <laughs> So we're now standing at the junction of Strand Street and what I call Factory Lane because at one time Factory Lane ran from the net factory which later became a, a stocking factory but at the time it was built it was a net factory and it was built by the Corrin family of Corrin's Tower fame and he had either invented or bought a machine that made uh, the nets for the fishing boats much more quickly and efficiently and cheaply than the old method of making them by hand. So from the factory down the shore road there, down to the, the prom, that was called Factory Lane. And this part was renamed Beach Street because some of the houses here became boarding houses. And if you were living in a, a, a town in, in the north of England and working in a factory, you wouldn't want to come to the seaside to stay in a place called Factory Lane. So they renamed it Beach Street. I was at a talk by Leslie Quilliam and he said that according to the 1891 census, there were 81 bakehouses in Peel, probably just one man businesses. And they might only be baking you know, a few hours a day and then selling the bread and then doing another job. And I think that a lot of the bread was being sold to the fishermen, to the fishing fleet, because at one time Peel Harbour would be packed completely solid with fishing boats and they say that you could walk from one side of the harbour to the other without getting your, your feet wet. And my father said the same thing because I think he must have got a job shortly after he left school. He used to deliver bread probably to the fishing boats and you could actually walk right across the harbour on the fishing boats from deck to deck. Now standing in what is now called Duke Street, but at one time it was called Duck Street, and behind me here are what if possibly the two oldest houses still standing in Peel, though it might be that some of the ones in Castle Street are as old or possibly older. We're standing on 
Bridge Street, which used to be known as the Gill, because there's actually a stream running all the way down. And I have actually seen it when the road has been dug up and you can see it's like an arched bridge, an arched tunnel right down. I was at the talk and it was claimed that the one running across Parliament Street in Ramsey from the, the Lickney stream to the harbour was the widest, not the longest, but the, the widest bridge on the Isle of Man. But I think this one is actually wider if you count it as a bridge. I remember when I was a little lad, I was with a schoolmate of mine, it might even have been before I went to school, and it was at the end of Queen's Drive up in Peel, where there were no houses there, and it was just a field, and you could see the stream coming along, and it went under the road and disappeared completely. And I think this is where that stream comes out. Now, I am now looking at the building here. It used to be a, a little shop owned by a man called Willie Woods. His wife had a place up at the top there selling ice cream. But he used to sell clothing and uh, almost government surplus sort of stuff. Double blank, they called them. And one time my father bought a pair of trousers in here. And when he got them home, he looked at them and there was mud on the knees. And he said to Willie Woods, he said, Willie, uh, how come there's mud on the knees of these trousers? Ah, well, he said, it must have been that the man who was smuggling them over the border from Southern Ireland fell over. <laughs> Well, this building behind here is down on the 1869 map as Temperance Hall. And sure enough, even in my time, it was known as the Rechabites, because the, the Rechabites was a sort of a temperance society, like a friendly society, almost like an insurance thing. My father used to go to it, and of course it was for non-drinkers entirely. I think he had to sign the pledge, but the, my father said he used to go here to the meetings. And then they go to the pub afterwards. But it used to be up a set of stairs, just up against that new sandstone wall there behind me. And up on top there, there was actually room enough to ride a bicycle round, but that's by the by, because I used to go to McVannan meetings up there. And I think previous to that, the, the Scouts used to have meetings up there as well, just occasionally, and jumble sales. This car showroom behind here is on the site of what used to be called the Albert Hall, which was, at one time it was the Peel Cinema before the pavilion further up the road became the cinema. And it belonged, or was run by a man called Howard Hugh. Not Howard Hughes, but Howard Hugh. And they used to call him up or down Howard because when the projector was running, if he changed reels, one frame would be in the top half and the top half of the next frame would be in the bottom half. So they'd all shout, up or down Howard? And that's how he got the name. But I remember working in there with my father, who was a painter and decorator, and we were painting in there. And there was a mural on the back wall of the stage. I don't remember what it looked like, but my father was very impressed by the fact that the mural had been painted by a man who had studied at the Académie Julien in Paris, which was a famous art school, had been at the time. There was also a man called Wee Bobby who was connected with this in some way. And my father has a saying about the day that Wee Bobby fell through the silver screen, so he must have been cavorting around on the stage and gone through the cinema screen.